Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation Malaysia, MOSTI, Yang Berbahagia Tan Sri Dr. Ahmad Tajuddin Ali, President, Academy of Sciences Malaysia, ASM, Honorable Professor Lee Yuan Se, President, International Council for Science, IKSU, Senior Fellows and Fellows of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, a very good morning and welcome to the signing ceremony between the International Council for Science, ICSU, Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, and the Government of Malaysia. For your information, the ICSU Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific was officially inaugurated on 19 September 2006 and its operation is governed by a formal agreement between ICSU and the Government of Malaysia, represented by MOSTI. According to the agreement, a review of ICSI regional, ICSU Regional Office performance would be conducted at the end of a five-year period. The review, the review which was conducted end of 2010 showed successful, successful performance of the office and the government of Malaysia agreed to host the office for a further period of five years until September 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite Tan Sri Dr. Ahmad Tajuddin Ali, President of ESM, to deliver the welcome remarks. Dipersilakan, Tan Sri. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yang berhormat, uh, yang berbahagia, Datuk Madinah Muhammad, Secretary General Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, Professor Lee Yuan Se, President of the International Council for Science, ICSU, and an Honorary Fellow of the Academy of Sciences, Malaysia. Honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning and welcome to one and all. It is indeed a pleasure for me to welcome everyone to this uh, very special event. Firstly, to witness the signing of the supplementary agreement between the Government of Malaysia and the International Council for Science, or ICSU, relating to the support of the ICSU Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. And secondly, to the Science Forum with the theme Cutting Edge science and the future of mankind which will be held immediately after the signing ceremony and to the foreign visitors a special welcome to Malaysia as mentioned just now and just for the record the ICSU regional office uh, for Asia and the Pacific was officially integrated on 19 September 2006, where the then Deputy Prime Minister of Malaysia, Datuk Sri Mohamed Najib Tun Abdul Razak, of course, who is now the Prime Minister of Malaysia. As mentioned also, that the office is governed by a formal agreement between the government of Malaysia and ICSU. And the government of Malaysia is represented by MOSTI, the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. And the office is managed administratively as part, integral part of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia. Well, after five years, as mentioned, the review has been done and the government has agreed to an extension for another five years. And today we are witnessing the signing of this supplemental agreement to that support to the ISU Regional Office. Over the last five years, I believe the Academy has not only provided a scientific and administrative home to the office, but it has also supported ISU Regional Office in many other ways. I believe the relationship between ASM and ISU Regional Office is synergistic and mutually beneficial, whereby the academy in, it forming, in performing its function can leverage on ICSU's vast scientific network and ICSU benefit 
from the support of a strong national body, the Academy of Sciences Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, today, <coughs> networking and collaboration has never been more important. We now live in an era of many global challenges. Top of the list is perhaps climate change. Other, no less daunting challenges include food and water security, energy security, cyber security, and the security of man himself. Much of the solutions to these challenges lie in science and technology. This is where international scientific collaboration has become essential if you are not only to deal with the risks posed by these challenges, but also to capture some of the opportunities that may emerge. Admittedly, the primary driver of collaboration is the individual scientist himself. Scientists have to be motivated to seek partnership with the best of their peers. They will have to strategize to gain access to resources, equipment and knowledge of their counterpart. In other words, the success of many scientific collaboration lies entirely in the hands of the scientists. I thus would like to call upon our Malaysian scientists to tap and leverage on ICSU's vast scientific network. ICSU is a gateway to gain access to new global knowledge and establish strategic international collaboration. Also, as we all know, we now live in a world where there is a rapid advance in, in, in the accumulation of scientific knowledge. It is literally exploding, particularly in the developed countries. The vast reservoir of knowledge has become increasingly useful to address world problems. The challenge now is how can we effectively connect to the world's best expertise, to the scientists and engineers in the developing countries, in the developed countries. This is crucial if the world is to benefit from such knowledge base. In my view, it is another area where ISU can play its role in assisting the developing countries to connect with the resources in the more scientifically advanced countries. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great opportunity for us here today to be able to listen to the three distinguished speakers in the science forum which will be held after the signing ceremony. The theme, cutting edge science and the future of mankind is very relevant in today's world where science and technology is universally recognized as critical drivers for achieving sustainable development and gaining access to knowledge, the knowledge economy and society. The Science Forum will not only help us understand the way forward for future research, but also to have the potential to enhance participation of scientists and from ICSU national member bodies in bringing the cutting edge science to the region. This, in my view, is an example of the contribution of ICSU to the scientific community and society here in Malaysia and in the Asia Pacific region. Ladies and gentlemen, I always believe that the academies of sciences can make important contribution to the crafting of international, regional and national research agenda. They play key roles in the setting and implementation of national science policies in their respective countries. The sharing of thought and the exchange of ideas, such as in the forum later, will no doubt further strengthen such roles. It is my fervent hope that the, the ICSU Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific will continue to play an active role in the effort to strengthen the science and technology collaboration in the region and even within Malaysia. The office can help facilitate the free flow of scientists and scientific knowledge across borders, provide support to scientific network in the region, as well as initiate new works, share information and develop co collaborative partnership with, scientific, strat with strategic scientific partners and many others. I would like to reiterate that the academy will not just be a host institution to the ICSU Regional Office, but we look forward to continuing this relationship with the hope that it will assist us in strengthening the science and capacity building in science and technology in this country and to forge an even stronger strategic partnership 
to work together for the benefit of society, science and society. Last but not least, I would also especially like to take this opportunity today to congratulate the ISU Regional Office on its contribution thus far, not only to the Academy and to Mosti and to Malaysia, but more so to the scientific community in Asia and the Pacific in, in general. The progress has made since its inauguration five years ago is impressive, and for that, on behalf of the Academy, I wish to express my gratitude to the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation for its strong support, continuous support to the Academy and also to the ICSU Regional Office. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Yang Baba Gaitan Sri, for the welcome remarks. Now we cordially invite Honorable Professor Lee Yuan Se, President of ICSU, to say a few words. Uh, dear President Tajuddin Ali, Tato Madina Mohammed, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to be here today to witness the continuation of this strong and essential partnership between ICSU and the government of Malaysia. In fact, as a friend of Malaysia, I visited Malaysia many times and feel very much at home here. With the generous support of Malaysia, the ICSU Regional Office for Asian Pacific has grown up a lot and made significant contribution over the past five years. For instance, during the Rio Plus 20 preparation process, the regional officers took the lead to mobilize hundreds of scientists through a series of regional workshops to provide variable scientific input for Rio Plus 20. The very first workshop was, of course, right here in Malaysia and was organized together with Ministry of Science, Technology, Innovation, Academy of Sciences of Malaysia, and UNESCO, and attended by 65 scientists from 20 countries. The Asia Pacific Region Office has also been very active on several key themes, such as urban health and well-being, integrated research on disaster risk, and energy. It has effectively engaged various research organizations and scientists in the region to develop regional science plans that have inspired and informed global level activities and strategies. The challenges confronting human society, sustainable development, poverty, food, water, energy, health, continued population growth, and the rising resource consumption have become, a, have become so big and complex that to address them require all the knowledge, wisdom, and ingenuity we can master from all regions. So we must connect to regional scientists and stakeholders and involve them in deep and meaningful ways to find transformative solutions for instance, the Asia Pacific, Pacific region is so diverse and undergoing so many pressing issues like poverty, disaster, and urbanization at the same time. If we could somehow carve out a different and more sustainable path here, we may very well have found global solutions as well. Asian Pacific is a really one of the typical global situation from well developed and to the not as well developed region or here. This is why global efforts such as Rio Plus 20 and the new Future Earth Initiative that ICSU and 
as organizations are working together and promoting, have put regions at the forefront. The QGRS, for instance, which already has many of the biggest government funders of sustainability research, and UN agencies on board, it will most likely feature a dynamic network of regional nodes and centers of excellence actively engage from research design and conduct all the way to working with policymakers on the implication of science. It was in recognition of this unique opportunity at this critical time that the government of Malaysia agreed to double its funding from around 125,000 euros to 250,000 euros while ICSU will elevate its own contribution from 30,000 to 50,000 euros. In addition, the Swedish International Development Agency has pledged to support the work of the regional officers for the next 18 months in the sum of 815,000 euros. If successful, an even greater commitment for 10 years may follow. These are very, very strong endorsements. However, as regional activities take shape and grow, we will also need the developed countries within the region to step up. Along with more resources, there is the cap capable leadership of Professor Noden Hassan, who is now the longest serving director of any issue regional office. These strong endorsements are a direct testament to the job he has done in nurturing this office and building up a superb regional network. Put it all together, and we have to be very excited about the future of the regional offices. But before we get too excited, we should remind ourselves of the challenges before us. It is not clear that the world is overdeveloped. People didn't like this word, overdeveloped. Humanity has become such a force shaping the planet that mainstream science has all but accepted the arrival of the Anthropocene. It means human activity play as as important role as natural forces shaping the future of the Earth. Today, we consume resources that will take 1.5 Earths to produce. It means what we are consuming takes 1.5 times Earth, or we are consuming what have built up on the Earth for quite a long time. And why dreaming of an American lifestyle for everyone? That would consume 5.4 times the Earth. And it's not just the rich countries, even developing countries such as China, Brazil, have already gone too far. Too far in terms of consumption and production of the waste this, unfortunately, applied to Malaysia as well. Malaysia is a developed country, overdeveloped country. Although Malaysia has achieved impressive economic development while en enacting many meaningful environmental protection measures, its development path is still unsustainable. GDP growth still occupy two central place in this vision of progress. We always dream on the high income society, increase our GDP without realizing we cannot continue to go on like this. We are already seeing the consequences of our overdevelopment ecosystem and the biodiversity are in decline. Extreme weather, and disaster seem to get worse year after year. And many of our best scientific minds believe now 
we are headed for a world warmer by 4 degrees centigrade or more by the end of the century. Now, scientists conceded maintaining the goal of 2 degrees is not likely anymore to be warmer, thereby risking catastrophes that may put in jeopardy the survival of humanity on this planet. And this is really quite serious. We don't want to imagine what would happen in 50 years. But if we continue the way we are, certainly it will be very disastrous. Making things all the more difficult, more than a billion people still live in poverty. 20% of the world population has no electricity. And the number of people without adequate nutrition increased by 20 million between 2000 and 2008. These are priorities that we must tackle while we search for ways to reduce humanity's impact. So it's no wonder whenever we sit together, we always said we have to develop a society equitably, sustainably, which just this means that our only chance to do to, is to change course and fundamentally transform the nature of human development. We have to shift our energy system to go back to the sun. If we said we want to go to a low carbon society, we try to go to the low carbon society, most of the carbon came from fossil fuel. Our ancestors, did not use much fossil fuel, all depend on sunshine. Sunshine provides enough energy in one hour, the amount of energy provided to the surface of the earth. It's about human society consumed for a year. So we should be able to go back to the sun and we have to reinvent our production system, our lifestyle, values, and the way we define progress. And that Asian Pacific region should do well and should do differently from the way Western society are developing or have developed. As member of the scientific community and of the human race, we must go beyond knowledge generation. Yes, much research remains to be done cutting edge science, science need to be developed, but it is equally true that we already know way enough to act, and we don't have much time to do it. If we do not bend the curves by the end of this decade, it means we don't start to reduce the carbon dioxide emission or change other things. The worst effect of climate change might become all but inevitable. I said we need to bend the curve by the end of this decade. With time fast running out, the fierce urgency of now requires that we push for immediate actions, solutions, and implementation. And this concrete action must happen at regional, national, and local level as well. Dear distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm aware that the challenge seems too great for such a small office here. But such is our collective responsibility as scientists and members of the human society in this day and age and this regional office can count on a world of strong allies, above all, Ixu Global. Science is a powerful tool on our side. It is universal language with the potential to help knock down barriers and build a shared vision and pathway forward. Together, let us find ways to change the course of human development for good. I remember 
I visited Malaysia for the first time 25 years ago, I was extremely impressed by your determination to bring the society to among the rank of developed country by 2020. And that slogan is still ringing in my ear, 2020. And then you will spend enormous effort in trying to protect the environment. And that's two things impressed me quite a bit. But time has gone very, very quickly. The 2020 is only eight years away. But now we have to re-normalize. We want to be among the developed country, but not among the overdeveloped country. We have to make reassessment of development. We can live beautifully, comfortably with nature and have a wonderful life. Might be a little more simple, not complicated, or not to use as much natural resources and energy. We can do it. And I do think country like Malaysia, forward-looking country, work together, lead Asian country, Asian region, to go to a new society that should allow people all over the world to follow us. Well, let us all work together and realize our dream. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lee, for the address. We shall listen more and share Professor Lee's interesting idea in the keynote lecture later. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to invite Yang Berbahagia Datuk Madina Muhammad, Secretary General of MOSTI, to deliver her speech. Dipersilakan, Datuk. Thank you, uh, Ms. Chairperson. Yang Berbahagia, Tan Sri Dr. Ahmad Tajuddin Ali, President, uh, Academy of Sciences, Malaysia. Honorable Professor Yuan Se Li, President International Council for Science or ICSU, Dr. Stephen Wilson, Executive Director of ICSU, Emeritus Professor Dr. Mohammad Nordin Hassan, Director ICSU Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased uh, to be here this morning to be a part of the signing ceremony between the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation Malaysia, or MOSTI, representing the Government of Malaysia and the International Council for Science, or ICSU. We are honored to have Nobel Laureate Professor Yuan Se Lee, President of ICSU, to grace this morning's event. Allow me also to take this opportunity to congratulate Dr. Stephen Wilson for his recent appointment as the Executive Director of ICSU, replacing, <laughs> replacing Professor Di Liang Chen. I was made to understand that this event is your first official trip to, after your appointment, to the ICSU regional office here. In light of that, I would like to warmly welcome you to our beautiful country, Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, Mosti's involvement with ICSU goes back to 2005, when the Malaysian government agreed to host the ICSU regional office for Asia and the Pacific in Kuala Lumpur. Throughout these five years, from 2006 till 2011, ICSU's regional office here has contributed significantly in mobilizing knowledge and resources of the international scientific community to strengthen international science for the benefit of the region. As the host country, Malaysia is extremely supportive of the fundamentals of ICSU which is to propagate international science in order to benefit the masses. What ICSU does at the global level is very much in line with what MOSTI is most passionate about at the national level, which among others is to identify and address pertinent issues in science which impact society 
as well as foster scientific culture among the masses. I understand that ICSU's activities are organized into three major areas. One, coordinating and planning research. Two, science for policy. And three, the universality of science. Many of ICSU's successful activities cut across all three areas. One of which draws my attention, and this is the initiative that will provide cutting edge platform to coordinate scientific research. Aptly named Future Earth Research for Global Sustainability, it should be able to respond to the most critical social and environmental challenges of the 21st century at global and regional levels. Malaysian scientists should be involved in this global initiative and ensure that our country will benefit immensely from it. I strongly believe that Malaysia should leverage on ICSU's vast international scientific network and tap into the wealth of knowledge that it has. Furthermore, the presence of ICSU rope within our shores represents Malaysia's contribution to international science and its presence in this region will continue to receive full support from MOSTI. Therefore, I'm extremely pleased that ICSU rope will be continuing their tenure in Kuala Lumpur until 2016 and this will be made certain this morning through the signing of the agreement, the supplementary agreement between the government of Malaysia and ICSU. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Malaysia's transformation since independence has been remarkable. Transforming from a low income developing country to an upper middle income economy in just over 50 years. This was achieved from visionary and inclusive development policies. In the final leg of the vision to become a high-income economy by the year 2020, the strategies which were, which were successful in the past seem ill-equipped to take Malaysia past the finishing line to join the ranks of developed nations, or as Professor Yuan Seli mentioned, overdeveloped nations. In order to propel the nation towards attaining the goals of Vision 2020, the nation has embarked on the National Transformation Program, which constitutes four pillars. Firstly, the One Malaysia, People First, Performance Now concept of inclusiveness and sustainability. Secondly, the Government Transformation Program, or GTP, of putting governance as an enabler, facilitator, and supporter of economic growth. Thirdly, the Economic Transformation Program, or ETP, which provides the roadmap towards becoming a developed nation by 2020. And last but not least, the 10th Malaysia Plan, covering a span from 2011 to 2015, where specific policies are initiated to drive economic competitiveness, including the removal of distortionary price controls and subsidies, as well as advancing trade liberalization in terms of equity restrictions and market access for foreign companies, especially in the services sector. The role of science and technology as a driver for these transformation processes is ever more pressing and imminent. To address this, Malaysia needs to leverage on expertise and knowledge that are available worldwide. As MOSTI celebrates 2012 as the year of science and innovation movement, I wish to stress that the government aims to increase science and innovation awareness, as well as to inculcate a science culture in our society. Only a relatively small portion of our society is actively involved in the creation of technology and innovation, 
as the understanding and notion that science and innovation can bring economic su success has still not caught on to the masses. Science, technology and innovation is still very much thought of as subject matters belonging to exclusive cliques, such as academicians and scientists. In reality, STI should be utilized by all segments of society from grassroots right up to the elites. As for Malaysia, STI is considered as the all-important tool which will hasten our leap to become a high-income economy by the year 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, toward this end, the National Grassroots Innovation Data Bank has been set up to highlight people-generated innovative projects and inventions and processes at the grassroots level and facilitate in building linkages between such grassroots innovators and formal networks, either in the public or private sectors. Ultimately, this data bank aims to recognize, encourage and celebrate innovation at the grassroots level. It is hoped that via the National Grassroots Innovation Data Bank, we will be able to promote wider social awareness and possible applications of grassroots know-how commercially or in the social and educational development of the country. At the moment, this database boasts of over 200 grassroots innovations which are ready to be commercialized. I was made to understand that in con conjunction with the signing ceremony this morning, an international forum has been organized with the very intriguing topic of cutting edge in science and the future of mankind. Now we are very fortunate to have leading scientists from around the world to share with us their insights on the latest developments in the world of science and technology, including Nobel laureate Professor Yuan Se Li himself, who is world famous for his achievements in chemistry. Upon hearing uh, Prof. Yuan Se Li's speech just now, I remarked to Tan Sri uh, Tajudin that scientists can come up with the best research findings. Scientists can make the necessary recommendations to government. But unless government takes on board those recommendations and turn it into national policies, there will be no outcome to address challenges that we are facing that you have noted. But even if Malaysia believed in it and Malaysia incorporated these recommendations into our national policy, it will not be as in impactful because it needs a global, global convergence. And here is where I believe in platforms such as Rio 20 coming up, that we could be well represented. For your information, Professor, the economic planning unit uh, of the Prime Minister's department is leading the delegation. I strongly believe that our National Oceanography Directorate, which is very much involved in scientific research on sustain sustainability, uh, should be in the main delegation. I'm sorry, Prof Noraini, I read your email, and I believe that we should be on board, and I will officially speak to the Director General of EPU. Because as, as we all know, Professor, you may know, um, our Honourable Minister of Science, Technology and Innovation chairs the CTI Ministerial um, um, Commission, I think, for the next two years. And I think we need to position um, CTI as a very important and uh, you know, integral part of Rio 20. Thank you. Now, I believe that forums such as these are excellent platforms to stimulate minds 
and to work as catalysts to trigger interest and to provide inspiration, especially to budding young scientists and students of higher learning institutions who are here this morning. I implore the young scientific minds here today to reach out to children and youth, women, rural folks, people with disabilities and non-governmental organizations to promote and inculcate creativity and innovation. And on that note, I wish ICSU Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific a very successful event and a productive five years to come. And uh, Professor Yuan Se Lee, I know that you're rushing to catch a plane after this, but since you are a frequent visitor to Malaysia, I hope you will continue to contribute significantly your wisdom uh, to our nation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yang Bahagia Dato. Kindly remain on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, our next agenda item is the keynote lecture by our distinguished speaker, Honorable Professor Lee Yuan Se, President of ICSU, with the keynote lecture entitled Science, Technology and the Future of Mankind. Please welcome Professor Lee. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I've been talking about this issue, advancement of science and the future of mankind uh, all over the world during the last several years. And I also gave a similar talk in the University of Malaysia last year. But I want to pay a little bit more attention to chemistry this time. And, but let's see. You will push, okay. Uh, I will start from the beginning of the Big Bang. Next slide, please. Well, after the Big Bang, it takes about 100 million years before, before uh, no, no, it's a 10 billion years before the solar system was formed. And after the solar system was formed, it took another four and a half billion years. It is interesting, when you look at the Earth, the special position of the Earth allow some life phenomena to start immediately after the formation of the solar system. I say immediately, it takes millions of years. And because the trajectory of the Earth surrounding the sun is not wrong, and the self-rotating axis is making an angle so if you look at the temperature variation of the Earth, next slide please, you will see every 100,000 years we'll go into the glacier period and then in between we will have a warm period. Now, in this oscillation, we are in the high spot. For the last 10,000 years, the temperature is stable, it's warm. Many of my friends, when they heard about global warming, they said, be patient, be patient. You wait for a while, 
temperature will go down and it goes down to minus eight degrees. Why you worry about two degrees, four degrees? You just have to be patient. But how patient should we be? We are talking about in between glacial periods will be hundred thousand years. Even temperature would would dip down, it will take ten thousand, a few thousand years. But we are at the top of the temperature, we don't have 10,000 years before something drastically happened. We are breaking the rhythm of this natural oscillation. Next slide, please. And because the phenomenon of life occurred and life evolved, and for quite a long time, everything happened on the surface of the Earth uh, because of the sunshine. So we are not going to run them. Sunshine recycle materials through the growth of biomass. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. And when our ancestors, so-called mankind, appear on the surface of the earth, we are part of the nature. Our human activity didn't disturb uh, natural cycle very much. And even about 250 years ago, next slide shows that the, the life level of the Aboriginal tribe in Taiwan, I think people in Malaysia can recall a couple hundred years ago, our ancestors lived like this. In this picture, what you see is everything. Housing, the clothes they are wearing, all came from biomaterial, all came from sunshine. Sunshine. And when I was young, I was six years old. During the Second World War, hidden in the mountain, there's no electricity. I certainly did live like this. But you look at another picture where Steve Wilson was born. 250 years ago, there's an Industrial Revolution. Soon after the Industrial Revolution, you see, next slide. You see a picture like this. What's the difference between that picture and this picture? In this picture, almost everything is dug out from the ground using fossil fuel to transform it, to cement, to steel, aluminum. So society changed. We detached from the sunshine and we started to depend on the fossil fuel. I'm a chemist. Stephen Wilson is also a chemist. In human society, for quite a long period of time, mostly depend on one kind of chemical reaction, that's the combustion of fossil fuel. You take the hydrocarbon, burn it, it forms a more stable molecule, carbon dioxide and water release lots of energies, and human society depend on that energy. And I, as a chemist, I spend enormous amount of time trying to understand elementary processes involved in the combustion process. Next slide, please. So if you ask me what my scientific life, I said I try to understand elementary processes like in the combustion process, quite complicated. More if you start to dissociate from radical, then combustion rules hydrogen, dimerize, add oxygen, rules hydrogen, and keep on going, and then it will form carbon dioxide and hydrogen. The final step will be CO plus OH from CO2 plus H. If you understand elementary processes, you will be able to understand time phenomena. Not only that, you can burn the fossil fuel more efficiently, reducing soot formation, and if you put some hydrogen, you can even make a diamond out of this burning process artificial diamond could be made. So when I was young, I wanted to see how chemical reaction takes place. Or well, I naked eye cannot see it. So device and apparatus follow the trajectories to see how molecules collide and transform into product. That's what I've been doing. Meanwhile, advancement of scientists and allow them to synthesize all sorts of things. Next slide see that the Wow, colorful word. 
all credit to chemist, chemistry, making all the things available, medicine, clothing, toys, and whatever. And after the Second World War, Japan take the lead for the mass production of so-called high-tech product. Then Korea, Taiwan, all join, and then individualized consumerism take over. Here, I didn't show iPad, iPhone, and intelligent cell phone system yet. But now, if you look at the kid, everybody has all the modern equipment that thousand years ago, even emperor could not, be, could not imagine to have all those kind of things. So, those are developing very, very quickly. Last year, we celebrated chemistry, the year of chemistry, because of Madame Curie received chemistry Nobel Prize 100 years ago. The reason she received the second Nobel Prize, chemistry Nobel Prize, was when she was awarded physics Nobel Prize. Nobel Committee was suspicious about her discovery of polonium and those elements. So a couple years later, they found out what Madame Curie was saying was right. So gave her the second Nobel Prize that was in chemistry. That was 100 years ago. So last year, when we were celebrating chemistry, year of chemistry, Peter Atkins, a very well-known scientist, teacher, uh, so something like this in the international uh, magazine. You helped? <laughs> well, what did he say? He said, this year, the whole world celebrate the international year of chemistry. The celebration are wholly justified because chemistry is hugely important for all of us. Wherever we live, without chemistry's contribution, the world will take Lake Kala, we will live in Stone Age conditions, underfed, dressed in skins, without the many devices that ease our lives and entertain us. And our lives will be short, our life will be short and painful. And he went on to list many things, which was quite interesting. Next slide, please. And he said, communal living is possible thanks to chemistry. You're talking about purification of water and make it more hygienic system going. The search for explosives spawned a green revolution, making through the fertilizer. So nowadays, when you eat a piece of bread, you have to realize 30% came from fossil fuel through fertilizer. Without energy, civilization would collapse. Plastics from oil, lighter cars, molecular computers, and intelligent crossings. Uh, that's very important, the preteris. And with those intelligent crossings, the sweat is evaporated very quickly, and you play tennis quite comfortably. And agent against disease, pharmaceutical com Companies, pharmaceutical company produce lots of compound, lots of drug, which was very useful. And how biology became chemistry, magicians of matter. We are material scientists sitting here. We know how we can make nano sciences, all new sciences, and get life better. The consequence of those development using lots of energy, lots of material, um, high mass production, population increase. And you talk about population in increase, antibiotic play a very important role. The invention of antibiotics keep the longevity going and going. So by 2010, population went up to 6.8 billion people. Actually, at the end of the last century, population was only 6 billion. Start at 1.5, go up to 6 billion. 2010 is 6.8. Two months ago, in February, we passed beyond 7 billion people. 7 billion people, and everybody consuming, consuming. So on the average, we are consuming 1.4 times Earth a year. Cut into virgin forest and keep on 
and all the fish in the ocean, or about 80%, is consumed already. Peter Atkins didn't say, but I want to say the contribution of chemistry. Next slide, please. We pollute, produce too many things, and Earth cannot digest. So waste piling up. The waste piling up, solar system, sunshine cannot digest it anymore. So during the last 50 years, it's really horrible. If you look at the indicator of the, during the last 50 years, temperature rises, biodiversity starts decreasing. You see the extreme weather, also they are depleted. And you can see many, many things, terrestrial conditions, or look at the N2O, methane emission. So during the last 50 years, impact of human activity to the environment is really quite serious. It's not just the problem of solving so-called energy. If we do not reduce using the resources substantially, we will not be able to turn things around. So by 2007, next slide please, they have shown a great concern by IPCC and Gore. So that year, the 2007, Gore and IPCC received the Nobel Peace Prize. And at that time, people look at the temperature rise in the situation on Earth. The orange color is, not too, is getting bad. And when the color turns red, it's really very serious. I just want to look at two columns. The second one is called risk of um, extreme weather. At the present time, temperature is uh, set at zero. It means before industrial revolution, temperature is 0 0.6 degree lower. Now it's zero. But extreme weather is already in the orange color. But if you go to the fifth column, risk of extreme weather, you know, the risk of discontinuity of the weather is in the white color. So you don't worry about suddenly weather become unmanageable, change very big. It's not likely to happen. That's why the European Union suggested the next slide. We have a two degree carbon above pre, two degree centigrade above pre-industrial region. So that's the dream we want to to reach said we will maintain the temperature not above two degrees. But today, I can tell you, all the scientists working on this area would say, probably it's impossible to maintain two degrees now. No, no matter what, it's not possible to maintain two degrees. Part of the reason is, in order to maintain two degrees, we will have to keep the carbon dioxide concentration at about 450 parts per million. We already exceed 390, and increasing at the rate of 2.5 uh, parts per million a year. At 207, it's two, two parts per million, so it takes, takes 30 years. 40 years from now, we'll reach 450 degree, 450 parts per million. But now it's moving much faster, and it's impossible to reach two degrees. Next slide. Next slide. Recently, the same was as Smith and the co-workers published another paper and shows that the situation is a lot worse. If you look at the extreme weather, we are in the orange color now, two degrees from pre-industrial uh, era to now, it's already in the red color. Two degree extreme weather will be very bad. And then discontinuity on the far right it's already become orange color. It means even if we could keep the temperature two degrees, we do have a risk to have really discontinuing this suddenly from ocean, a lot of methane, the carbon dioxide coughing up, or from frozen land of Siberia, emit lots of things, and temperature cannot control very well. So we can say we have to wake up. We have to wake up. Next slide shows that the awakening is quite important. And awake to the fact that it's, it's time for us to wake up. And 
accede to the fact that our world is overdeveloped. At the present time, as a humankind as a whole, consuming too much, producing pollution. Too many people consuming too much, producing too much pollution is the current situation. So uh, I said, human society as a whole is overdeveloped. People didn't like that description because the middle of country want to keep on going by using renewable energy to substitute what they, they're doing. And poor country want to develop. That's certainly they have right to do so, except we should not follow the same footstep. That's the main, main problem. So we are talking about low carbon society, low carbon society. Next slide, please. Well, low carbon society means we have to go back to sunshine. We have to go back to sunshine. Reducing the use of fossil fuel, we go back to sunshine. Sun, in a sense, produce energy in such a vast amount. In one hour, solar radiation, which cover the Earth, will be equivalent to the energy human society consume in one year. So all the young people said, gee, we should be smart. We should not be as stupid as our father and mother. Keep on digging the fossil fuel and try to keep the sunshine away. We really need to use sunshine. That's enough. It takes time to do it. But certainly, if human society were to survive, we will have to learn to go back to sunshine. Or part of the energy could come from when solar systems are created, like geothermal energy still remain, or some nuclear energy was also remain when the solar system was created. But largely, we do have to go back to sunshine, go back to the nature. That's the process we have to go through. Otherwise, if you look at all the indicators, there's no hope. After the Second World War, very famous scientist called Huxley came, stood in front of the ocean and said, gosh, there are so many fish in, this, in the ocean. Human society would never be able to consume some, so, so much fish. But now, if you look at the ocean, 80% of the fish stock has been all harvested. Many species already lost. And so, we have to wake up, we have to go back to sunshine. When I say we go back to sunshine, lots of young people say, no way, no way. You want me to go back to the, the barbaric period of time? I said, no way. I said, no, that's not the way we are suggesting. What we are suggesting is with current science and technology, we can use this much smaller amount of energy and much smaller amount of natural resources and live a better life. Industry will be developing, society will be developing, except use energy more efficiently or reduce the amount of energy we use, reduce the amount of resources we use. Well, I'm talking about back to sunshine. Sunshine really do lots of good things for us. Now I want to shift to chemistry because uh, Nodan wants me to talk about cutting edge chemistry also. So let me move to cutting edge chemistry. When you look at the sunshine, I want to look at the entire globe and look at the, I did mention ozone is depleted quite a bit in those indicators. And in the 70s, Sherry Doran, Mario, uh, Mario Molina, and Crutzen came up with a suggestion that because of the fluorochlorocarbon, uh, ozone layer is displeated. So what they suggested is the following. If you have a chlorofluorocarbon in the upper atmosphere, photochemistry dissociate and produce chlorine atom. Actually, Stephen Wilson was talking in this kind of photochemistry process, elemental process, which will produce radical species. Chlorine will with ozone and form chlorine monoxide. So chlorine destroys ozone. And chlorine monoxide with react with oxygen atom, which are abundant because ozone dissociated into oxygen atom and O2. So oxygen atom react with CO to generate chlorine. 
So that's called chlorine cycle. That's the reason ozone is depleted in the atmosphere. A scientist knew about that. We suggested a way to solve the problem in country sign Montreal Protocol. And so ozone destruction is kind of slow down. That's a good example of what scientists have done through the scientific investigation, influence the policy. So change the course. Well, later on, there's another interesting thing. No, no only ozone is depleting. There's an Antarctic uh, ozone hole creation. In the cold Antarctic lower stratosphere, ozone depletion is a lot faster. And Mario Bonita immediately realized if the temperature is low, two of the chlorine monoxide, those are dimers, to form chlorine monoxide dimer. Monomer does not absorb visible light. It's not going to dissociate very easily, so it takes ozone, oxygen atom, to create chlorine. But once you form chlorine molecule dimer, it will absorb photon and dissociate quite easily. So chlorine regeneration will go through chemical reaction and photochemical processes, and that process is fast. That's why in the Antarctic lower stratosphere, temperature is lower, lima is formed more easily, and in the morning when sunshine starts to irradiate, then chlorine depletion is faster, so low temperature region of Antarctic generated in the ozone. That model certainly explains what's going on. Next slide, please. So the ozone hole depletion is because the chlorine atom liquid with ozone generated O2, O2 and CO, this cycle is enhanced by the formation of chlorine monoxide dimer that will absorb the photon at 3,000 to 4,000 ohms long and dissociate the chlorine atom in O2. But that theory, we thought we understood, was challenged by 209. In 209, Scientists, Pope and the co workers, published a paper and said that theory might be wrong. So, Nature published an article that said chemists poke holes in ozone theory. Said that, that ozone theory might not be right. Why it's not right? Next time I show you what's going on. You see, long time ago, when Someone measured the chlorine monoxide photoabsorption cross section, how effectively chlorine monoxide dimer would dissociate. Look how in 1990 show a curve like this. And the more in the same year is a little lower in the yellow color. But the more did the experiment with harder in 1995, the cross section went lower. Every time when you show that the, my data is different from the previous one, then paper get published. And people got lots of attention. And then Pope published a paper in 2007, and Pope said, oh, those are wrong. My measurement shows that the cross section is really small. So in this region, it's more than 10 times smaller than what previous people measured. If Pope turned out to be right, then cross section is too small to make the ozone hole because it's not efficiently dissociating. Cross section is so small. If cross section is high, then molecule dissociate very efficiently. So Backholder's experiment shows that they, you can explain ozone hole problem, but the recent experiment cannot solve ozone hole problem. So NASA said, you scientists, should find the cross section within the certainty of 50%, not a factor of 10. And this is almost like a, a climate scientist. Scientists always say, you said two degree plus minus one is one degree or three degree. And say, we are not sure, 50% uncertainty. 
politician said, you don't know, do you? One degree or three degree? Well, the future Earth will solve that problem of getting closer. But they say, one degree or three degree, you don't know. You better shut up. Don't tell. Here is a factor 10. So NASA said we have to determine within 50%. So I thought we should be able to solve that problem. We can determine within 1%, not 50%. So next slide, please. This, this slide I tried to show you what was the problem. Problem is the following. You make a radical species like chlorine monoxide. You don't make pure species. Those radical species always have some impurities. So most of the people will do experiments, make a cell, try to produce chlorine monoxide. There you have a chlorine molecule and chlorine dioxide and other things in there. You shine the light and measure the absorption of chlorine monoxide, but other species are solving. So you change the chlorine monoxide concentration and do it again, and then attribute some of the absorption to chlorine monoxide. What I'm saying is, this type of experiment is large quantity, subtracting large quantity. So you have a one million uh, subtracting 999,000 something. And when you have a large number subtracting and a small number left, it's not as reliable because there are uncertainties. So we thought, okay, we can do it cleanly. So, I'm an uh, expert in doing molecular beam. And so if I have a cell, maintain low temperature, con temperature control, then I make a hole to let the molecule leak out from here. So there's a radical species, chlorine molecule, molecule leak out. And here, I have a mass spectrometer. I only want to detect one species, that is COOCL. Other species will keep on coming, but my mass spectrometer only tuned to that mass. But mass spectrometer is tricky. Sometimes bigger molecule give you the same mass. So I want to identify this by physical law. So I have a chopper here. Chop the beam. So molecule will be chopped. Most of the time it will be stopped. Window will open and molecule will let it go. I have a defining element make into the beam. Cold slit condense all these uh, background molecules and let it lead to the mass spectrometer. If my species is clean, then the velocity distribution will follow Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And next slide, please. So if you look at the chlorine molecule, that is exactly follow Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution after the chopping. This is time of flight. The next one is COOCL. It's clean. If you have a heavier one, there's a bump through heavier one. If you have a light one, it will be a bump through light one contributing. But COOCL, which the given mass, the velocity distribution follows the maximum distribution. So, come back to the previous slide. So what we do is this. After we identify, we are seeing other, the only species we want to see. And this is almost like if, if somebody fall in love, a boy fall in love, then his girlfriend becomes so beautiful. And the girlfriend could be among thousands of people. He can always, at a distance, identify, that's my girlfriend. <laughs> and that's what we're doing. We have a mass detector. There are a lot of things coming out, but the only thing we are seeing is chlorine monoxide dimer. The others, we don't see it. So now we have a laser. Shine the laser, dissociate chlorine molecule, and also dissociate COOCL. Absorption cross sections, chlorine molecule is very well known, known to a thousands uh, of uh, one part in the southern. So I can compare the absorption to break up the molecule. Next slide, please. So you shoot the beam, laser beam, deplete the chlorine. I can adjust the laser beam to deplete the chlorine monoxide and then we can get exactly by taking the ratio. And next slide, please. After we did the experiment, this is the first two measurements. Then is when time goes on, 
from 1990 to 2007, cross section becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, and it means science getting worse and worse and worse. And the, the point we measure is here and here. Two shows the temperature dependence. One is 2,000 degree K, one is 250 degree K. There are some temperature dependence in the longer wavelengths. I don't want to explain here. But I want to tell young people is whenever you see the new publication, and so this is the better experiment. That's not true in this case. When time goes on, data become worse. Worse in previous, exp the first experiment is closer to the real. So when we put that data in, we scan through all the uh, velocities and then we put it back. The model of chlorine monoxide destroying the ozone to make ozone hole, that model is inconsistent with all that atmospheric observation. So that is the right collection. And so it's interesting, I did say in combustion, in human society, one kind of chemistry, combustion of hydrocarbon, generate all the energy for human need in the old Antarctic ozone hole. It's the photochemistry of one single species, the, the CL or OCL, that determine the, how big the ozone hole will become. So very often when people ask me, you do such a detailed study of elementary chemical reaction, would that really helpful? Helpful in understanding complicated phenomena? In a sense, yes. In combustion, it's really the burning of hydrocarbon, ozone hole, the CO plus OCL. The person who, uh, one of the person who worked on the ozone hole, Sherry Roland, a very good friend of mine, just passed away a couple of months ago. I don't think I have time to go on or cutting edge, but I do want to show a couple of slides to show you what am I doing and what, what kind of thing we can do. Next slide, please. After I became the president of the academy in Taiwan, I have to deal with very complicated system. I think the human being is very complicated. And in my institute, we have 7,000 7, those, those complicated systems in 30 institutes. I start with complicated system, and sometimes people say, that's impossible. People have their own mind and wouldn't follow the rule of physics. And so I thought, a look at Maldi would be interesting because we are dealing with a species which is not homogeneous, which is not a crystal. That the process to put the biological molecule into the mass spectrometer. So you have a molecule embedded in matrix. Shine the laser, molecule will be evaporated and produce some ions. Next slide, please. And that technique is really very important. If you look at the development of mass spectrometry, there are all sorts of spectrometry invented as time goes. But next slide, please. In the year 1983, Tanaka, Karas, and Hillenkamp invented the methods of MAUDI, matrix assisted laser desorption ionization. It means you put the biological molecule in the matrix, send the laser, molecule will be evaporated as an ion. And next year, John Fain is also a very good friend of mine who also passed away very recently. You see, the sad thing is after you get older, many of the friends just say goodbye and, and then leave the earth and one by one. Well, Tanaka received the Nobel Prize because he invented very useful method for metric assisted laser desorption ionization. If you ask him, what happened? You say, Professor, you don't ask me. I'm a technician. I, I developed the method. I really do not know. Not only he didn't know, and lots of people work on this, still use it as a magic. So next slide, please. Next slide. Well, maybe go to the next slide. Next slide. So 
people find many matrices which are good for peptide, protein, uh, some of the matrix are good for glycoproteins, some of the matrix are good for heavier one. This is magic. Everybody has a handbook and said for what kind of sample you use, what kind of matrix, but do not know why. Why we should do this. And then later, several years later, it's a theory. Next slide, please. All those matrices are aromatic hydrocarbon and with some functional group, make hydrogen bonding or some of the carboxy group attached to it. So vapor pressure will be low with aromatic hydrocarbon. They absorb photons in the visible region. So next slide, please. Next slide. The scientist of Krohimus, he made a suggestion Ma what Maudi is going on is molecule absorb photons, but it's not enough to produce ions. So very often, two excited molecules pull the energy together, one go up, one go down. And then highly excited molecule will collide with another excited molecule, then you have enough energy to produce ions. So here's a scheme of photo absorption accumulated energy, so energy pooling. But I don't believe it. I don't believe any, any, any of this. I think you can see that the many people among the Nobel laureates don't trust each other <laughs> because uh, they, they are finding this important. But Tanaka said he didn't know. But Fukuma said that's the way it's going on. But that's not true at all. We're dealing with a condensed phase. So next, next slide, please. You see, if I take another molecule uh, to bind together, then you'll find that the, it's not a single molecule anymore. That, uh, that uh, two molecules stick together, there's a weak bond of forces, so hydrogen bonding. Then something could not happen in the monomer, could happen in the dimer, because proton transfer energy will go way down, way below the ionization potential. So my question is, if I work on the condensed phase, two molecules together, why electron transfer to other molecule didn't happen, which is a lower energy than ionization. Proton transfer, proton affinity is even higher. Proton affinity will bring the energy way down. So my question is, why not the proton transfer processes, which occur at the thermal energy? So internal combustion will take place. What produce ion? is the thermal transfer of proton. So next slide, very quickly. I, I don't have time to go through all the detail. So what I'm trying to tell you is what I said was really true. In the condensed phase, there's a radiate, it's absorbed. Immediately, it goes through internal conversion, become heat, proton transfer takes place, and then sublimation of the entire plume occurs, and efficiency of detecting mass in the ion depends on sublimation process and the temperature you reach. And if temperature is too high, molecule decomposes, temperature is low, sublimation will not occur. You don't see ions. So we are doing systematic investigation during the last couple of years. And as I said, this is a very complex system and it's not reproducible. But even if it's not reproducible, there's a basic principle hidden behind. One can find it. So now I have a very good understanding of what's going on. So my next step is, OK, how come carbohydrate? One cannot do Maudi with carbohydrate. They always said it's 1,000 times less sensitive. Now I know what's going on and even understand when people use it, ionic liquid, liquid, what is going on in the process. So in the next few years, I hope to show that, the, yes, carbohydrate, glycoprotein, you can do the same thing, which by much higher efficiency. So I only tell you the cutting edge science of my part in dealing with some frontier 
problem. And so doing fundamental science is very important. Those will be related to, to the society in a very different way. But I still say that the, as a scientist, fulfill that scientists, science can make benefit to the society. But still, we are feeling that the problem we are facing is so urgent. We have to do something more quickly. We, you, we keep on talking without make that into action and transform our society. We don't have much time left. So it's interesting. I go back to the laboratory and discuss with students what to do, and quite excited that things moving on. Then I, at the same time, I have to deal with all the problem. I have to leave pretty soon because I have to have a video conference with um, people in UNESCO and talking about real plus 20 issues. But thank you very much for your audience. I spent a little much, a little more time than I should have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lee, for an excellent and insightful lecture. Unfortunately, there is no Q&A session due to time constraints, so perhaps you can address your burning questions to Professor Lee during the tea break. Before we adjourn, please be informed that there will be a science forum on cutting-edge science and the future of mankind after the break. All are cordially invited to the tea break at the foyer. Thank you.